You know, for all of the treasures of the Louvre Museum, down every corridor, around every corner, there's a sign that points you in the direction of one single work, like it's the Holy Grail. And when you find it, it's smaller than you thought, darker than you thought, recessed into a wall and covered with a thick layer of bulletproof glass. And if you can work your way up through the crowd to get to the front, do you know what you do? You take a picture. But why? Do we even know? Why is it that this painting, it's a portrait of an unknown woman, a Florentine's merchant's wife, has become arguably the most famous painting in the world, adored by everyone who comes to see it, and reconsidered by artists again and again over the course of centuries? I can tell you it's not because of some of the more far out theories, including the one that suggests it's actually a portrait by Leonardo of himself, dressed as a woman. No, in order to understand the genius of the Mona Lisa, we need to put it into the context of 15th century Florentine portraiture. You know, the convention of the portrait of depicting real human figures, earliest, the earliest convention begins with the profile portrait. Think about the kind of portraits that you see on coins in your pocket or on medals. It was the easiest way to represent the likeness of a person. Now, at the very beginning of the Renaissance, in the early 15th century, artists began to experiment with what we call the three-quarter view. In other words, instead of posing like this, artists would pose, um, would pose their figures with more of one side of the face showing than the other, at an angle to the picture plane, which allowed the sitter in the picture to make eye contact with the viewer. Now, initially, this was only done for male portraits, and female portraits kept this traditional profile pose, which was sort of fitting considering, considering their status in society. They became sort of like virtuous, decorous pieces of property. So the focus was not on who they were, but on what they possessed. All of the women are wearing beautiful jewelry and elaborate clothing. And the background is usually just treated as a plain blue neutral sky or as a very small box-like domestic interior. I can blow up one of these pictures for you. And this is a painting of a woman named Giovanna Tornabuoni by Domenico Ghirlandaio. Now Ghirlandaio's picture perfectly fits this mode. She's in pure profile, she doesn't engage us, there's an incredible emphasis on her uh, possessions, like her beautiful jewelry and her garments, which were decorated with pearls as a symbol of her purity. Now, if we consider this alongside the Mona Lisa, it's interesting to see that these works are only separated by about 15 years, but they are worlds apart. The Mona Lisa no longer sits in profile. She turns her face outward to engage us, and the pose is quite dynamic. You'll notice she's not just got her body turned towards us, but that her arms and her chest and her face are all at slightly different angles, like she's rotating on her own axis. She's got an expression on her face that matches that sense of movement and makes us think about her interior rather than her external appearance. And in keeping with that, you'll notice that she's not wearing any jewelry, even though we can see her hands, and her clothes are quite simple. Replacing that box-like domestic setting, we've got this deep landscape filled with waterways and rock formation and atmosphere and perspective. In other words, it was genius. Do you know, we know more artists' names who lived in the 15th century than we do for the entire history of art up until that point? But only to a few do we give the title of genius. Now, chief among these you might think of Leonardo da Vinci or of his younger contemporary and sometimes rival, Michelangelo Buonarroti. And one of the reasons we consider them to be geniuses is because these are artists that we categorize as universal men. They were artists who were gifted in more than one discipline. This is really quite true of an artist like Michelangelo. Michelangelo was a painter who worked in both tempera and fresco. He was a sculptor who worked in the very disparate media of marble and bronze. 
He was an architect who designed the dome that sits atop St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. He was even a poet. He wrote several hundred sonnets. Things get a little bit more tricky when we think about Leonardo. Leonardo was a painter, but he painted very little. He was a sculptor, but arguably we have no sculpture by his hand. He was an architect, but he built no buildings. Uh, he was a theoretician and a writer, but he published no treatises. And this makes it challenging to figure out how we think about his genius. Now, Leonardo first and foremost thought of himself as a painter. In fact, in his writings, he ascribes almost godlike talents to the painter in his ability to create. And just a portion of this says, if the painter wishes to see the beauties that would enrapture him, he is master of their production. And if he wishes to see monstrous things which might terrify or which would be buffoonish and laughable or truly pitiable, he is their Lord and God. And at the end, in fact, therefore, whatever there is in the universe through essence, presence or imagination, he has it first in his mind and then in his hands. But as I said, Leonardo didn't paint very much. Just to put this into some sort of context, we can think about the Dutch Baroque painter, Rembrandt van Rijn, who lived a very similar lifespan to Leonardo. Now granted, he lived 150 years later and times were different for painters, but on a conservative estimate, Rembrandt painted hundreds of pictures during his lifetime. For Leonardo, we have a body of works that looks something like this. And if you're a skeptic, and I am a skeptic, and you take away those works that are problematic in terms of their attribution, you can get down to something that looks like this. Maybe about a dozen or so works. And even of these, quite a few of them are either unfinished or are in exceptionally poor condition. Now, Leonardo was considered to be a genius even in the 16th century. The writer Giovan Paolo Lomazzo wrote, Leonardo received from the sun the ability to form everything that human intelligence could ever consider or imagine. Now, sometimes modern scholars have taken to talk about the myth of Leonardo's genius. Um, in other words, that maybe we've gone too far in ascribing so many inventions to him. Leonardo invented the bicycle. Leonardo invented the helicopter. He invented musical instruments, scuba gear. But maybe the best place to really start would be to think about what we mean when we say genius. It's a sort of elusive topic and maybe a bit subjective, but people who write about genius generally agree that there are a number of components that feed into a person's genius. We can consider them to be someone's innate intelligence, uh, the opportunities they have, their ambition or perseverance, and their creativity. And we could start at the beginning with this idea of innate intelligence. Everyone loves the idea of a natural born genius. And so maybe we look for some physical reason, genetic reason that people are the way that they are. It's this impulse that led people after Einstein died and without his prior permission to harvest his brain and dissect it to see why he was the genius that he was, which by the way, you can go see um, on display at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. The same impulse, though far more difficult because of history, has led people to go look for the physical remains of Leonardo which unfortunately were lost because the chapel that he was buried in was destroyed and then rebuilt following the French Revolution. But the presumed remains of Leonardo have been recovered and they're buried in the chapel of St. Hubert. But people have gone looking for genetic material of Leonardo. In fact, in the last few years with this great interest now in families and DNA, and people have gone looking for the living descendants of Leonardo. Leonardo himself had no children, but he had a number of half brothers and half sisters who did. And so we think maybe by getting at his genetics, we can get at his genius. Now, other than that, all we can really do is look at Leonardo's background. 
Leonardo was born in 1452, just outside of the small Tuscan hill town of Vinci, which is in itself is about 20 miles outside of the city of Florence. His father was a man named Ser Piero. He was a notary, so he was educated and he was a legal professional. And um, Leonardo's grandfather, Ser Antonio, was as well. That was the sort of family career. We don't know as much about Leonardo's mother, who was a woman named Caterina, and she never married Ser Piero. So Leonardo grew up in the household of his father and his paternal grandparents. And when Leonardo was five years old, they made the decision to move the family from Vinci to the city of Florence, which must have amazed the young Leonardo. This was a city of maybe 40,000 people at the time with its comparatively massive skyline dominated by the recently completed Cathedral of Florence. The Cathedral of Florence is actually a really good way to think about what genius meant in the Renaissance. This was a building that was begun in 1296 and its initial plans and scale, it was built on such a large scale that the architects and engineers of that time did not know how they were gonna put a dome on top of the building. There was this wonderful idea that man would find a way. Now, it took until the early 15th century when the sculptor turned architect Filippo Brunelleschi conceived of a plan to put the massive dome on top of this building. And when the young Leonardo moved to Florence as a boy, they were still completing that white lantern that sits on top of the dome. In fact, when he was a teenager, Leonardo witnessed the construction and the hoisting of the pala, that big metal ball that sits on top of the lantern. And he actually makes a notation in his notebook about how it was made. But more than anything else, the move to Florence gave Leonardo another key component to the formation of his genius, which was opportunity. 